Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. I don't know why my heart is full to see all of you here today and just want to welcome you. If you're a first-time gift, we love you. We've been praying for you. I want to welcome you to church. I hope that your time here has been already encouraging and inspiring to you. And um, if you're watching online, wherever you're at, let us know where you're watching. I know someone mentioned they're watching from Canada, different places. Um, let us know. And if you live within driving distance, we invite you to come because there's nothing like an in-person worship experience at TC. How many know that? So if you're within driving distance, come on down. We promise to make you feel right at home. We've got some of the best people on the planet here. My wife and I were just bragging on our Transformers earlier. We're like, man, we're just, I'm the luckiest pastor in the world. We are the luckiest to pastor you guys. We just love you. And uh, we're so great to see you. So um, if you're just joining us today, we're in week two of the sermon series, Anxious for Nothing. Let me tell you what we're doing in this series. We are declaring war against anxiety and worry and fear. Things in life will make us worried, but how many know that we do not have to allow anxiety to dominate our lives? So my prayer for us this morning is that we see peace increase and anxiety and worries and fears decrease, and that we learn the biblical truth by Dr. Paul, who gave us the prescription for anxiety, that we learn the truth, that we do not have to be anxious for nothing. And let me just kind of fill you in on where we're at. Last week, we discussed the problem of anxiety. Do you know that anxiety is the number one mental health issue in America today? And it's impacting not just adults, but young people. Young people, high school students, are struggling with an anxiety level that's higher than the average psychiatric center patient in the 1950s. Studies show, and this was pre-COVID. We also have one of uh, FDNY EMTs um, he's a chief in the Bronx, and he said, Pastor, you also want to make mention that anxiety is hitting young adults. Suicide is on the rise. And we're seeing anxiety take its root in our hearts. But I just want to tell you today that regardless of what you're struggling with and what you're feeling today, there is hope. There is a way out. You don't have to be dominated by anxiety, but instead we can have victory over anxiety in our lives. Now, in this series, I'm not so much talking about medical or chemical anxiety in which people need prescription medications because of a chemical imbalance. That is a real thing, and it's we can't spiritualize everything. But I want to talk to you more about situational anxiety. When we feel like situations that come across our path are so great, that we be, we're overcome with worry and fear. You know, last week we defined anxiety as angst, dread, worry. Anxiety is like a media showers of what ifs and it impacts our lives. But I'm grateful for the word of God, the scriptures by Dr. Paul who prescribes the remedy for anxiety. And this is what I've asked you to do. I've asked you to read this verse, these verses for 21 straight days and allow it to marinate your heart and mind. This is what we're gonna be talking about next couple weeks, and we talked about it last week. It's found in Philippians chapter four. Now, now remember, Paul is writing this with handcuffs on. He's sitting on death row, okay? I don't think any of us are here on death row. But he's sitting on death row, uncertain about his life. He's been beaten. On his back, their wounds, their scars of the years of beatings that he took from the Romans. And the first thing out of his mouth is what? Rejoice. Isn't that awesome? Rejoice in the Lord always. And he kind of knew our response. 
he, he wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And we, our response is, what? You know what I'm saying? Let's practice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again. Rejoice. Exactly. Then he says, let your gentleness be made evident to all. I love how he repeats it. The Lord is near. You may feel like God is distant, but he's not. He's near. He's with us. He's with us. Do not be anxious. Why don't you say that with me? Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And watch this, watch this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Lord, we speak peace. Finally, my brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, why don't you say that with me, okay? Whatever's, 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 okay, this is the word I had problems with last week. Is it admirable or admi admirable? Admirable, hands lifted, admirable. You're right. He's coming against the pastor like that. Come on now. You're correcting the pastor. She's right. Most of the time she's right. What does he say? Think about such things. Today I want to give you the nuts and bolts. I want to teach you how to get on the path to peace. A teacher, how to get on the path to peace. Y'all ready? I feel like we should pray. I feel like it. Take a deep breath. Jesus, here we are. Our hearts and our souls are open to your presence and your word. Speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The path to peace. So, Many, many years ago, I bought a mountain bike, and uh, um, I was so excited that I decided to use it on a mountain. So I went to Lake Minnewaska. Anybody know where Lake Minnewaska is? It's in beautiful Hudson Valley. It's in Ulster County. It's really high, and we had our mountain bikes, me and my buddy from work. We're going to mountain bike Lake Minnewaska Mountain. So we went up to the mountain and we went down the path. They had paved paths, but you know what? They weren't as challenging as those other paths that were off the path. So we decided to get off the path because we are guys and we know how to mountain bike. So we start going down this path into the woods. Eventually the path ended. And you know how this story is going to end. We didn't go back up because we know where we're going. Several hours later, we are wandering in this wilderness at Lake Minnewaska in the mountains, wondering where the heck are we? And i be honest with you, I was calm and cool. Oh, we'll find something somewhere at some moment. But then you notice the sky is beginning to get a little dark. It wasn't dark. You know, the sky starts changing and you're realizing, oh, snap. This might be my last day alive on earth. Because, you know, you listen to these newscasts. People are lost in the wilderness and they die. So I'm like, dude, we've got to find a way out. At that moment, I wasn't so anxious. But you know what? I started feeling some nervousness, some fear, some anxiety. Until I saw a road. We finally got to the bottom of the mountain. Wherever we were, we saw a road which brought real excitement to me at that moment and took us another couple hours to climb up the mountain through the road. And I got to thinking about the path to peace and I kind of got thinking about anxiety and I thought to myself, you know what, that's a great picture of someone who's struggling with anxiety. Because people who are anxious 
feel like they're wandering in a wilderness with no way out. They feel like they're lost and overwhelmed and the darkness is going to begin to settle in and panic begins to settle in and people that struggle with an anxiety dread what might happen and they fear death and they fear life sometimes and I just want to encourage anyone who's struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression, who feels like there is no way out, I just want to encourage you and tell you there is always a way out. Regardless of what you're going through, regardless of the hopelessness and the weight and the despair and the anxiety that you're feeling, let me tell you, there is a way out. If Jesus is still alive and we declare and believe that he is, how many know that there will always be a way out? Scripture tells us that Jesus is the way out. He is the truth. He is the life. And I want to encourage you, don't ever feel like there's no hope, no way out from what you're experiencing. We know suicides are on the rise, hopelessness, depression. And sometimes when we're in anxiety, we also want to medicate and numb what we're feeling. That's why addiction's at an all-time high. That's why overdoses are at an all-time high. That's why alcohol and pills and all these things, we're trying to medicate our anxiety to calm our fears. But I'm here to tell you that anxiety, um, 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 peace, you cannot create peace. Peace is not circumstantial. Peace is found in a person. You might have temporary peace, but long-lasting peace only comes from a person who is called, in Isaiah 9, 6, the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is God with us. And as long as God is with us, how many know that we can have peace? I really believe that God wants to transform our anxiety into peace. But the only way that we can experience that is if we transfer our anxiety to him. God wants to transform the anxiety, but it's up to you and I to transfer our anxiety, our worries, our fear to God. And when we do, this is what he promises. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. You cannot find peace in anything in this world. You might have temporary relief. You might feel relief and peace for the moment. But long-lasting peace is only found in a person. He says, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Let's say that together. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I feel like that's a word from somebody here today. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Just be at peace. God's got this. And I still wear my God's got this bracelet from two years ago. Just reminds me, you know, my, you know what? No matter what I'm going through, God's got this. And he has a peace that transcends our understanding, that guards our heart and our mind. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Remember, anxiety comes with like a, a meteor shower of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. What if I get sick? Or what if I lose my job? Or what if I get COVID? Or what if I run out of money? Or what if we go to war? Or what if... I get into a car accident. Or what if my loved one gets into a car accident? How many have struggled? You don't have to raise your hand with the what ifs of life. And that's what anxiety does. It's this low grade of fear that's constantly running through our minds. Those what ifs in life. But God says, no, I have something better. You don't have to be dominated by the what ifs of life. Because I am in control. I am sovereign. 
I will provide for you. I will meet your needs. I am your God. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. But I know the question you're asking. That's great, Pastor. Um, all right, peace. I want it. Everybody want peace. I want it. But how do I get it? How much does it cost, right? How do I get this peace? And that's a question we're all asking. How do we receive the peace that Jesus gives? How do I find peace? How do I find peace? Here's the answer. It's very simple. We find peace when we pray. Now, don't check out on me because I know what you're thinking. Oh, great. He gave the prayer answer again. Whatever you're going through, pray, 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 pray. But I've tried praying. God, help me. And it doesn't work. Prayer doesn't work. I've tried praying and I'm still anxious. Pastor, don't give me the religious answer. Don't give me the pastor answer. Because I've tried praying. Y'all tried praying? Have you tried praying to, for God to take away your anxiety? And has your anxiety disappeared? For some of us, no. And I really believe the reason why is because we have a misunderstanding of what prayer is. We think prayer is, dear God... I pray that you give me a great parking spot at the Monroe Woodbury Commons because I don't want to walk long. Oh, Lord, I pray that we have a great tax return. Oh, God, please touch my husband's heart that he may clean up his clothes and do his laundry, Lord. Oh, Lord, I pray that I get great grades. Oh, Lord, bless this food. Because it doesn't look too good right now. But Lord, I pray you bless it. And we go through life with these simple prayers that we offer up to God. Or if we're in traffic, oh God, I pray this traffic lets up quickly because I got to get to work. I'm going to be late. And for most of us or a lot of us, that's the extent of our prayer life. But prayer is more than just lifting up these words to Jesus. Prayer is more than talking to God. Now, Peter, um, Paul says this. He says, Do my, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. But Jesus gives us a deeper understanding of what prayer is. And when you truly understand the power of real prayer, then prayer will usher in the presence and the peace of God. And this is what Jesus said when he prayed. He says, but what? When you pray, what do you do? Go into your room and close the door. Prayer is not meant to be seen and heard by everyone. Okay? It's not what prayer is meant to be seen and heard by everyone. Jesus taught us that when we pray, we are to find a place to be in solitude with God. Prayer begins by finding a place with Jesus a place in with you, when you are alone with God, a place in which you have created space to be with the Prince of Peace. Yeah. And the reason why some of us haven't overcome anxiety is because I truly believe that we haven't created space to be with peace. And we don't have peace because we have not learned or understood what it means to transfer our, peace, our anxiety to God to receive his peace. But Jesus said, when you pray, close the door and pray to your father who is not seen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you with peace. It begins when you're in solitude. Now, just to go a little deeper, solitude is not necessarily a place outside of us. Solitude is a place inside of us. I hope you all getting that. Solitude is a place inside of you where you commune and meet and connect with God. And then in verse 7, Jesus teaches, he says, and when you pray, just shut up. Okay, is that good enough? Like, stop babbling. He says, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. In other words, just be silent. Sit with me. 
for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. He knows. Think about that. Before a word comes even to the tip of your tongue, God knows you need peace. God knows you need rest. God knows what you're going through. But he just wants you to create a space, a place in which you can go into solitude with him and be present with what is, with the one who is present in all things. He wants you to sit with him. He knows what's on your heart. He knows what's on your life, going on in your life. You see, prayer, I used to teach this for years, prayer is communicating to God. You know what I've learned? That it's more than communicating to God. You know what I'm learning? Is that prayer is communing with God. Say that with me. It is what? communing with God. What does it mean to commune with God? It's the interchange of intimate thoughts or feelings from deep within your soul. It's prayer without words. It's prayer that comes from your soul. It's a connection with God that you have that's not external. It's inside of you. Why? Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's presence dwells in you. And what God wants us to do is slow down our lives. Create space to be present with the one who's the ruler and in control of all things. And commune with him. Share your thoughts and your feelings without words, speak with him. So how do we commune with God? Well, we commune with God in solitude. That's what I'm teaching, right? In solitude. Solitude is when Jesus says, go to your room, close the door and pray. But solitude can be not just in your room. Solitude can be at the lake. I love on, on my Sabbath, I love to go into nature and I love the trails and I love to be outdoors and and those are my, some of my deepest moments of solitude with God. Solitude can be in my car. Solitude can be in my bedroom. Solitude is a place and a space that I've created and opened up uh, where I open up my soul to be present with what is and with God. Notice what he says in Psalm 46.10. He says what? Be still and know that I am God. How else would we know that he is God unless we took time simply to be still? But isn't that hard? Yes. Right now, some of you are like exercising incredible discipline to be still because we're active people. Right? We're on the go. And it's hard to be still. But God is saying, no, be still and know that I am God. Silence, solitude, solitude and stillness are a way that we commune with Jesus, are a way in which we transfer our anxiety to Jesus, are a way in which we open up our soul to Jesus and experience the peace of God. You know what I'm teaching you? I'm teaching you that peace is not a feeling. Peace is not a circumstance. Peace is a practice. Some of you don't have peace because you're looking at your circumstances to create peace. Or you're looking for that loving feeling. You got that loving feeling. Oh, that loving feeling. You've got that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone. God, oh, and that's the way some of you feel right now. That peaceful feeling is gone because it's more than a feeling. Peace is a presence, and we have to learn how to practice 
the presence of Jesus. Practice the presence. How do we do that? We find place of solitude. Y'all want to go a little deeper here? Y'all with me? Is it too much? We commune by expressing what's within. So now that we're in solitude, we open up our soul. And some of us are anxious because all of our anxiety has been pushed deep beneath the surface of our lives. And we want to ignore the feelings. We're going to ignore the worry, ignore the fears, or stuff them down. But God is saying, no, bring them up. But when you bring them up, bring them before me. Because I want to take your burdens. That's why scripture says, cast your cares on the Lord. Cast your worries on the Lord because he cares for you. So you open up your soul to Jesus and you unload on God. And it's okay to unload on God. He can handle it. He can handle it. So how do we do that? Well, this is how I'm learning how to do it, journaling. Journal, I believe every follower of Jesus should have a journal in which you're just journaling. You, you open your heart. You slow your pace. Journaling takes time. It builds faith. But most importantly, it releases feelings and emotions. And I started reading through my journal yesterday just to kind of, I said, what would be cool is to read an excerpt from my journal. I'm like, I'm not reading this. Because there in my journal are my raw emotions and feelings, my doubts and my fears, my hurts and my pain. It's when I journal that I open up my soul to Jesus. You know what that's called? That's called intimacy. God wants, and I remember this, just sitting with Jesus, you think he knows what you need, but sometimes he wants you to bring what you need to him. Not necessarily with word, but with your emotions, with what's happening in your soul. But let me continue, because you can journal, but you also prayer. Prayers with words. The second deepest level of prayer is without words. But the deepest level of prayer is prayer from your soul that comes from a well within you. Sometimes those prayers, that's why Paul says that sometimes the Holy Spirit will pray in and through you without words but with groans. Groans. The groans of the Spirit. You pray in the Spirit. Or you just unleash your soul, what's within you before God. This is how we commune with God. It's more than saying the Our Father, which I, I pray, and I pray often, but it's more than just praying the Our Father. It's more than doing a Hail Mary. It's sitting with the King of Kings who has given us access into his throne room in which we are present with what's happening in our lives. Not trying to bring to him what we want to bring to him, but bring to him what is happening in our lives. Unpacking that from our soul. Releasing that to God. Sometimes with words, oftentimes without words, but the deepest form is from our soul, right? We also commune with God through contemplation. What's contemplation? It means to look thoughtfully for a long time. Look thoughtfully for a long time. God wants us to contemplate on his word, the word of God, the scriptures. He wants us to contemplate on his presence. He also wants us to contemplate on truth. You see, what's happening, listen, some of you are wired for worry. See, what happens is your brain creates pathways. And if, if you walk off the path of worry... I mean, off the path of peace for a long time, you're going to create a path of worry in your brain. On the sides here is called the amygdala. The amygdala is where we react to things in life. And where, um, anxiety is often said that it's a, it comes from a toxic or hypersensitive amygdala. In other words, if you watch something in the news, oh my gosh. If you hear something, you receive a call, from somebody, and they're saying, you know what, I have to go get a test. You know, they have to test to see, oh my gosh. And we are wired for worry, but God wants to rewire our brains 
for peace. That's why Paul teaches in Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is your mind rewired for peace? Through contemplation. That's why Paul says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever's, 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 think about such things. Think about it. Get a hold of your thought life. Flip the script. Don't allow your thoughts to run wild. Keep your mind focused on what is true. It doesn't say, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is on CNN, whatever is on Fox, whatever is on MSNBC, whatever is on CBS, whatever is on the news, think about those things. What have we done? We've wired our minds with fear and anxiety by what we've presented in front of our minds. That's why the Bible says, do not put anything that's vile or vulgar before us. Because the eye is the lamp of the body. I don't know if y'all are getting this today. It might be too heavy for you. I don't know if you're getting this. But the eye is the lamp of the body. Whatever you present before you creates thought patterns in the subconscious that affects the way you think. That's why it's so important to take a step away and identify the false patterns of thinking that we have in our lives and focus on whatever's true. What is true? God is on the throne. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I just tell you, it doesn't matter what's going on. That is true, my friends. Whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure. Think about those things. Flip the script. Don't let your minds run rampant. Don't let your minds go rampantly, right? Flip that script. Whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, think about those things. When we do, watch our anxiety be transformed into peace. So we don't have to live anxious lives. We don't have to be dominated by anxiety. We take hold of our thoughts. That's why the scriptures say, take every thought captive and bring it under the submission of the truth of Jesus Christ. That's truth. So this last, really, as we close, I'm going to present to you a picture of a person who has been transformed by peace. Someone who has been going through struggles and has been transformed by peace. Listen to this. Ready? This is David. David in the Old Testament. Listen, he shared his prayer journals with us. He shared all of his thoughts and feelings. And David was being hunted down by Saul. He was hunted down by armies. He was running for his life most of his life, early life, young adult life. But this is a picture of a person who's ruled by peace. Y'all ready? Here we go. When besieged, I'm calm as a baby. When all hell breaks loose, I'm collected and cool. Come on, somebody. I'm collected and cool. I'm not going to get worked up. I'm not going to get triggered. And if I get triggered, I bring that trigger into the submission of truth. Submission of truth that God is for me. That God is working on my behalf. That I have virtually no control of the things of life. That God lives in me. And greater is the one that lives in me than anything I'm facing in this world. And God is for me. He's not against me. So when I'm besieged, the New International says, when, when war breaks out against me, I'm calm as a babe. I'm collected and 
cool. And now he asks God, he says, this one thing I'm asking, not to live without worry. He says, this one thing I'm asking, and only one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. And it's there that I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll look long at his beauty. And I'll study at his feet. That's what Paul says. Paul's taught that, right? Now David's saying it. David's saying, I'll contemplate his beauty. That's what you need, church. You need to learn how to practice peace and how to practice his presence. Because when you take a step back and you sit with God and contemplate his beauty, the peace of God begins to flood your soul. And then, and then David says, you know what? Because that's the only quiet, secure place in a noisy world. It's the perfect getaway from the buzz of traffic. David. Contemplate his beauty. Sit at his feet. Learn to practice his presence. Peace is not a feeling. Peace is a practice. Peace is a practice. Peace is a practice. So let's recap real quick. I'm going to go back. So when we commune with God... We commune with solitude, right? This is what I want you to do this week. I want you to find a place of solitude. Begin to practice peace. Place of solitude with God. Not just on Sunday, but throughout your week. And then, when you're in solitude, I want you to be still and know that He is God. And then when you're still enough to know that, I want you to express what's within your soul. You could do that through journaling. Or you could do that in prayer. But most importantly, I want you to contemplate, take a long, thoughtful look at your God, at his word at his truth for you. And then I want you to rewire your brain by thinking about what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about such things. And then, <laughs> when, I'm, when you're besieged, guess what? You can be calm as a baby. You can be collected and cool because you're contemplating his beauty. And the reality is, church, that's the only quiet and secure place in the world. I leave you with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. In Him, Power heads in prayer.